Thank you very much. It's very good to be with you all here today. I'm Daniel Stabile. Um, forgive me, I'm going to have to set my stopwatch here. If I don't do this, I'm going to go on way too long, and I don't want to interfere with the, the panel that's coming next. Uh, so I'm an attorney based in Miami um, in the United States, and I co-chair the digital asset practice at the law firm Winston & Strawn. It's a very old law firm, over 170 years old, but I think it's a testament to the importance of the digital asset market in the United States that even a very old law firm um, devotes substantial resources to blockchain and, and digital assets. And we have a practice group of over 80 attorneys around the world who are practicing in this space. Um, and it's a very vibrant practice. In fact, you see this type of practice um, forming in all of the major law firms that are based in the United States right now, in part because the regulatory environment is, is still being formed. Um, equally important to me, uh, to my legal practice, um, is since 2018 I've been teaching a course at the University of Miami Law School on digital asset regulation. Um, it's a popular course, not necessarily because we're the best professors at the school, but rather because Again, this is an area of law where young people um, have an opportunity to help create the regulatory and legal landscape. And that's very exciting for, for young law students. It's not common. Normally in law and regulation, the law is so well settled that any changes are done on the margins. But there are very fundamental aspects of the regulatory environment today that are still being formed. So earlier today, I've been listening to many of the, the panels and the speeches, and we've heard about compliant mechanisms for offerings of security tokens in the United States. That is absolutely true. There are ways to compliantly offer security tokens in the United States. Um, and I want to return to that point later, but what, what I want to focus on a little bit is that overall in the United States, the regulatory environment for digital assets um, is unclear. Um, and that's important for a few reasons. Um, one is that when you look outside of the STO asset class, and into some of the other types of digital assets like stable coins and other types of NFTs. Um, as was referenced just moments ago in the earlier panel and with the comment, there is an interaction between other types of digital assets and STOs. And if there are other aspects of the digital asset regulatory landscape that are uncertain or unclear, I believe that that has an impact on the entire ecosystem. Um, in addition, uh, sometimes it's not so easy to draw the line between what is a security token and what is not a security token. From a legal and regulatory standpoint, it, it begs the question as, is this digital asset a security? And that very question is subject to multiple pending pieces of legislation in the United States and various court battles. Um, for example, is a stable coin a security? Um, the SEC, our main securities regulator in the United States, has taken the position that Binance's stablecoin, for example, was a security because there was yield that was offered along with it. Or what about an NFT? Um, earlier we heard about um, digital art. 
related NFTs. Um, let's say that there is a NFT that points to ownership of a single digital asset, not a fractionalized share, but just one NFT references ownership of one particular asset or another type of digital collectible. Um, it's very much an open question in the United States right now as to whether that would constitute um, a security. The fundamental problem in the United States is that there is no comprehensive federal legislation or regulation that even attempts to classify the wide variety of digital assets into different regulatory buckets. And as many in this room know more than most, um, there are a nearly infinite variety of properties and characteristics that a digital asset can be imbued with. Um, some can much more resemble a traditional security based on the payment of dividends or ownership shares into a particular enterprise. But there are many other types of digital assets which have um, a variety um, of different properties. And I believe that these different types of digital assets call out for completely different regulatory structures. So, a question that we're very much struggling with in the United States right now is do the existing securities laws, um, are they sufficient to deal with all of the nuances and complexities um, of this emerging asset class? Or um, do we need a new legal and regulatory structure in place? So because there's no federal law that's specific to digital assets, um, what the regulators have been doing is looking to existing bodies of law, um, which in many, case, in many cases have been on the books in the United States for many decades. Um, the most active regulator in the space is the Securities and Exchange Commission, the SEC. And they are relying largely on laws from the 1940s. Um, their view, arguably, is that virtually every digital asset, with the exception of Bitcoin, um, is potentially a security um, under, under US law. Um, the Securities Act itself and the Exchange Act, which are the two main pieces of legislation in the United States from which the SEC derives its authority, never actually um, define what a security is other than to list a variety of different categories of financial instruments. Some of those categories of instruments are um, still used in common parlance today, um, a, a note, for example, some sort of debt instrument, um, or a stock or a bond. But obviously, these laws and regulations were passed and promulgated not only decades before digital assets came into being, but decades before the technology that underlies digital assets was even conceivable. So how does the SEC find its basis of authority um, in the Securities Act and the Exchange Act? And the answer is that there is a catch-all term amongst those lists of types of instruments that constitute a security. And um, the SEC has relied almost exclusively on the term investment contract. What is an investment contract? Um, that is not something that is defined. Um, there are many legal cases since the 1940s through the present day trying to define what an investment contract is, but the most important case is a case from the 1940s about tracts of land in a Florida orange grove. I'll come back to that in a minute. 
So rather than promulgating any new regulations that specifically deal with digital assets, the approach that the SEC has taken is what's often referred to as regulation by enforcement or regulation by litigation. So rather than making new rules or deferring to Congress to create new laws, the SEC has brought actions against issuers of digital assets or other parties in the ecosystem, such as digital asset exchanges, and staked their position in those litigations. Um, the SEC or any government entity in the United States is um, a, a formidable adversary. So most of those cases settle before you get a ruling from a judge. And this is particularly a problem in the digital asset space because a lot of the businesses that have been targeted are early stage companies without the resources to really wage a battle with the SEC. But that is starting to change now. There are very senior people at the SEC itself who disagree with the SEC's approach. Um, the SEC is a commission. There are five commissioners at the top of the hierarchy. And um, at least one of them, possibly two, um, very vocally and publicly dissent to this SEC approach of regulation by enforcement. The other thing to keep in mind is that the SEC is just one of many financial regulators in the United States. We also have the CFTC, which is our main commodities regulator, which has taken the position that basically every digital asset um, is a commodity. You have the IRS, our tax authority, which takes the position that most digital assets are property for tax purposes. Um, and that's just at the federal level. We also have the states. So most states in the United States regulate digital currency businesses as money services businesses, sort of the same way that you would regulate PayPal or Western Union in the United States. And in the US, um, your relevant authority, state authority, is not just where your company is based, but where any of your customers are based. So if you have customers in all 50 states of the United States, you potentially need to be licensed as a money services business um, in all of those states unless you're taking the approach that you're a securities broker dealer or something like that, which would trump. The point that I'm trying to draw out is there's a tremendous amount of complexity um, in the US regulatory environment. Um, what is the current state of affairs right now in terms of the regulatory, um, the regulatory question? Um, well, there are really two fronts where the industry as a whole is battling with the government. Um, the first is Congress. Um, the easy way to solve this regulatory uncertainty is our Congress could pass laws that would clarify overall the regulatory environment. Um, if any of you follow... Um, U.S. politics generally, um, you are probably not particularly optimistic that our Congress is going to pass anything um, in, in the near term. It's, it's very difficult for um, Congress in the United States to agree on, on anything right now. Um, but there is some hope. Um, there's a bipartisan piece of legislation that would um, clarify um, which regulators are responsible for which types of digital assets in a bill um, that was introduced by Senator Gillibrand, um, a libertarian um, senator from the state of Wyoming, and, and Gillibrand, who is a Democrat from the state of New York. 
So the fact that you could have people on both sides of the political aisle jointly propose a type of legislation gives the industry some hope that um, this could be passed. The second front is the most interesting um, and the more likely to produce some immediate results in the near term, and that is the court system. So I mentioned that the SEC is waging battle in the courts against a lot of digital asset businesses. Now we have reached a time, um, a level of maturity in the United States where a number of businesses in the digital asset ecosystem are well capitalized and well resourced companies with uh, the assets and the resources generally to fight with the SEC in a court of law. Um, so you're seeing a number of interesting decisions coming out, um, some of which are um, really taking issue with the SEC's approach. Um, for example, um, in the earlier panel, I heard um, mention of uh, ETF. Um, so there's a very famous uh, proposal in the United States right now for a spot Bitcoin ETF by, by Grayscale. The SEC has taken the position that Grayscale cannot issue that spot ETF, um, but the decision was uh, challenged in a court of law and the D.C. Circuit Court in Washington, D.C. took the position that the SEC's approach was arbitrary, capricious, and basically overturned the SEC's decision. So there is some possibility that we'll see a Bitcoin spot ETF um, in the near future. The other case that's drawing a lot of attention in the United States is the Ripple Labs case. Um, Ripple Labs, of course, is one of the most uh, noteworthy businesses in the digital asset ecosystem, and they have their own native XRP token, which is designed to facilitate cross-border payment. Um, the SEC has taken the position that um, XRP is a security. It doesn't have... You know, if you are a holder of XRP, you're not entitled to any profits of Ripple Labs. It doesn't contain any of the attributes that you typically associate with the security. There are no dividends that are paid or anything like that. It can go up in value. It can go down in value, true. Perhaps some people purchased it merely as an investment opportunity, but it serves a use. This is what I'm talking about when I say sometimes it's difficult to blur the lines between what is a security token and what is not a security token. To me, that does not sound like a security token, but the SEC took the position that it was. You got out of the court a recent decision um, which was complex, um, but generally regarded in the industry as a victory, um, the court took the position that XRP itself is not a security, but it can be issued as a securities offering under certain circumstances. Um, I mentioned the Howey case about tracts of land and a Florida orange grove previously. This is the seminal case in the United States as to whether a digital asset is a security or not. And there, the orange trees, the oranges themselves were not securities, but they were sold um, along with other rights where there would be a central management group who would uh, maintain the land, harvest the oranges, sell the oranges. And the reason why people purchased the tracts of land is not because they wanted to eat the oranges um, or live on the land or harvest the fruit themselves. They purchased it because someone else was going to do something with the property and they would make money. That is the essence of an investment contract um, under US law. So the analogy that's used in the Ripple case is that just as XRP is not a security, oranges 
or orange trees are not securities. But under certain circumstances, XRP or oranges can be sold in a way that the primary reason to purchase the instrument is for purposes of profit rather than use. And under those circumstances, they can be deemed a security under US law. So one way of looking at the digital asset environment in the United States is that it's fraught with some risks. But I would suggest that this this lack of clarity um, actually provides um, many opportunities um, in a few important ways. Number one, um, given a relative lack of clarity in the regulatory environment in the United States, a lot of major financial institutions, which tend to be quite risk averse, have not yet fully entered the market. Um, of course, every major financial institution um, now has um, sometimes more quietly, sometimes more loudly, but every major financial institution is exploring blockchain technology right now for various reasons to you know, improve their internal processes, to lower their own transactional costs, or, or to somehow capitalize um, on, on the investment potential in this still relatively nation asset class. But today, not only have the you know, large financial institutions not fully moved in, but most of the hedge funds and proprietary trading firms have not fully um, moved into the market. So for individuals who, are, who have a little bit more tolerance for risk and an alternative asset class, um, I would suggest that the regulatory uncertainty was something of a gift for those individuals because it's provided an opportunity to take a significant part of market share um, that you otherwise wouldn't have in the United States. It would be cannibalized by the major financial institutions long ago. So that's a good thing. And you know maybe we're in similar moments in, in other parts of the world um, as well. Second, if, and we're going to talk more about this, I suspect, in the panel, so I don't want to devote too much time here. But for those who have a STO, um, a security token, that clearly is a security um, under US law. It, it, it has the properties and characteristics of traditional uh, stocks, for example. There are very well-established rules in the United States that would apply here. There's nothing stopping or forbidding you from conducting your offering in the United States as long as you comply with all of the securities regulations and rules as if it were any other stock. And so what does that mean in the United States? Um, it is a complex regulatory environment, but particularly if you're partnering with other organizations, you can navigate that environment. Um, one important consideration is the offering itself. So in the United States, an offering of securities um, needs to be registered with the SEC in a public offering or much more commonly in the digital asset space at least, um, offered pursuant to a registration exemption. Um, there are a variety of registration exemptions in the United States, but most digital asset issuers rely upon an exemption um, called Reg D, which allows you to sell to um, accredited um, investors if you're doing general solicitation. Um, or even some non-accredited investors if you're not doing general solicitation. Um, there are other ways to get the issuance off the ground, um, but it's important to not only consider how to compliantly do the initial issuance, there are also restrictions that come along with the issuance. So in the United States, if you're making an offering pursuant to 
Regulation D, um, the main exemption that I just mentioned, there are restrictions that follow the initial issuance. There's a restricted period, for example, in which that digital asset can't be resold. Um, but again, for those industry, for, for those issuers who are willing to devote themselves to doing this in a compliant way or partnering with organizations that can help them navigate that process, there's, there's a great deal of opportunity. And then the final sort of bucket um, of considerations I would mention is it's not just the issuance itself, which it's important to do in a compliant way. Also, um, other businesses in the ecosystem that touches the digital asset have to consider whether they themselves are subject to regulation. So this is where you see um, newsy and splashy cases in the United States, like Kim Kardashian um, is being tagged by the SEC as promoting a particular digital asset. Because in the United States, if you're going to promote um, a security, there are regulations um, as to uh, anti-touting regulations. You have to disclose the fact that you're being prepaid to promote. Um, you need to disclose um, some details of the um, arrangement that you have with the issuer. And then, of course, to trade on the secondary market, any security, you need to be a registered exchange or a broker-dealer um, a licensed broker-dealer with what's called an, uh, a form ATS. So, um, in summary, uh, with respect to STOs in particular, there is a very well-trotted path for compliance um, in the United States. But I submit that we won't be able to have the STO market fully flourish until a number of the ancillary categories of digital assets um, have a more fully formed uh, regulatory environment. So there are many individuals in the United States working very hard right now um, on, on trying to do just that. But I believe that even in the United States today, we should still view this as the very early phases of uh, a technological and, and financial uh, revolution, and I think we're still on the ground floor. I will stop there, and maybe a few additional comments um, from me at the next panel. <laughs>